Welcome to the Women in STEM webinar hosted by Graffiti FTC. We are so glad you were able to join us this morning or afternoon, depending on where you're joining us from, to hear presentations from four amazing speakers. We're gonna wait just one more second and we will begin the webinar. In our pre-registration, we had people register from nine countries and 14 U.S. states. We'd love it if you could put in the Q&A, which is at the bottom of your screen, where you are from, and if you are on a first team, what team you are affiliated with, and we can see where people are joining us from today. We got a team from Springfield, team 10123. And we have people from our team 18367. We have more teams from Minnesota and Pennsylvania. New Jersey. Again, welcome to everyone who's joining us this morning. We're so glad um, you could be here. Um, so I'll just go through our quick agenda. We will have four women in STEM speakers. Our first speaker is Susie Armstrong, the Senior Vice President of Engineering at Qualcomm. Next, we'll have Ms. May Ahn, a computer scientist at the National Institute of Standards and Technology. Third, we will have Ashley Flegel, who is a project manager at NASA. Our last speaker is Ms. Gabby Inder, Director of Avionics Production at SpaceX. After our speakers, we'll have a fun game of Kahoot for our attendees with prizes for the winners. We are FTC Team 18367 Graffiti, which stands for Greendale Robotics, advocating for first and inspiring tomorrow's innovators. We are a rookie team from Greendale, Wisconsin, and we're so excited to be part of FIRST and listen to our speakers this morning. Three members of the team are hosting this um, today. I'm London, and I'm the Connect Coordinator on the business team. I'm Megan, I'm the Technical Lead and Team Captain. And I'm Erin, the Design Specialist on the Mechanical Team. As we start, please put any questions in the Q&A and we'll get to them as soon as we can. In this webinar, we will hear from four amazing women in STEM who each have interesting and unique career paths to share with us. Before we begin, we'd like to give a quick shout out to our sponsors. Neither this webinar nor our season would be possible without them. Please follow our team on social media so you can hear about other great events our team hosts. Our Twitter and Instagram are Greendale FTC, and our Facebook is Greendale Space FTC. Our first speaker today is Ms. Susie Armstrong, who is a Senior Vice President of Engineering at Qualcomm. Ms. Armstrong started at Qualcomm working on Global Star and then early CDMA base station projects. She was a pioneer in bringing internet protocol to the cellular industry, resulting in the first web surfing on a cellular phone in 1997. Since then, she has held various leadership positions, first responsible for the development and commercialization of all the software that drives Qualcomm's chipsets, and then as the head of world custom, worldwide customers engineering. In 2015, Armstrong joined Qualcomm's government affairs group, where she brings an engineering and product background to government affairs work in worldwide public policy, including intellectual property protection, cybersecurity, STEM, 
and STEM diversity. Ms. Armstrong, if you'd like to begin your presentation now. Great, thank you so much. Um, it's a it's a tremendous honor actually to be invited to speak today with the other speakers uh, on on the roster. Um, I have to say, Qualcomm is, has been for years a major uh, sponsor of first robotics at at all levels, and uh, I've had the opportunity to meet some of the teams, some of the local teams in the San Diego area, and also some of the worldwide teams. Um, so uh, again, thank you uh, for inviting me to speak today. And um, I'm just gonna go through a little bit of my background and uh, hopefully we'll have time for some questions and you can ask me anything you want and I'll answer it if I can. <laughs> um, so, you know, my background is, as the, the bio says, is computer science. Um, in, in high school, I was actually going to be a veterinarian, <laughs> but uh, I toured the Primate Research Center at UC Davis many years ago and I realized I probably couldn't tolerate the pain and suffering of a, of a medical field. And, you know, computers don't, you know, cry or, or scream when you, you have a bug. <laughs> um, so uh, I went into um, college, I went to, to Cal Poly San Luis Obispo and um, uh, I discovered uh, programming and I discovered computer science and it was, it was fun. And then I finally realized, oh, I could actually make a pretty good living at this. And so I had worked, um, I'd worked for, I've had two opportunities to work for amazing uh, companies. I worked first for Xerox. I did the first um, 10 megabit ethernet driver. 10 megabits doesn't sound so impressive these days, but uh, uh, I worked on data protocols throughout my career. At, at Qualcomm, you know, I think I think the story of my career has been um, really taking opportunities, building the background, and then taking opportunities that initially might look a little odd. Um, for example, at uh, at Qualcomm, I was working in the late '90s on um, on what the industry thought was was uh, uh, you know digital. Uh, data, which was circuit switch data and, and digital facts of all things. <laughs> we can talk about that later. But, um, you know, uh, coming from a computer background and coming from Ethernet and a data protocol background, um, my, my observation is this, you know, this cell phone link that carries voice is just a digital link. So why can't you just carry data? And that's what led to... Uh, the invention of the first, um, you know, packet uh, connection to the internet uh, over a cell phone connection. And when I give some of these talks in in DC, I have I don't have the phone with me, but I have the first phone that we actually surfed the net on at the big industry show in uh, 1997. And it's a little flip phone, and it's got a screen about one inch <laughs> in diameter. And we were so proud of you know, bringing up a little web page on this tiny screen at 14.4 kilobits a second. So, um, you know, fast forward. Uh, so how did, how did I end up in government affairs? I had, uh, I had led the software group. I, I had worked extensively overseas, um, both in India with our first um, development office in India and with our customers in, in Asia, in Japan and Korea and, and China. And those were just fantastic um, times. Uh, you know, a, a STEM career, as you all know, really sets you up to, to do a variety of different things. And um, about six years ago, I went to our uh, government, government affairs group. Um, I have ties to DC, like a husband <laughs> in, in DC. And um, when they offered me the position, I, you know, I'm, I'm in engineering. And I said, so, so what do they do? <laughs> what does government affairs do? And it's turned out yet, yet again, to be a, a, a fantastic uh, uh, career move and, and really fascinating. So what, what, do, what does an engineer do in, in uh, government affairs and in policy land? Well, we, we really, I really spent a lot of time educating policy audiences on, on tech such as you know, 5G and, and AI. And this is really important because policymakers and their staff are, are really 
really, you know, their expertise is in making policy and in uh, legislation and such. And so they're very, very interested and hungry for information on how, you know, how tech affects, you know, not only how tech affects consumers, but how, you know, how, how they best support, you know, moves into supporting STEM, into uh, competitiveness, into legislation, you know, for R&D funding. And so we have found it's, it's really critical. All of these big initiatives are, are really, you know, government and industry partnerships. All these initiatives that move, you know, tech forward, that move the world forward, that move the nation forward. So it's been, it's been a really impactful, um, not only for, for me in my career, but it's been a really impactful um, um, move. Uh, to actually work in in government affairs, and you know, I will, I will close with. Um, I was thinking of some fun stories, and uh, one of my most recent fun story. I have lots of fun stories about you know, terrible deadlines, and uh, you know, su supporting uh, uh, customers in integrating our products into their their devices. But um, the government affairs fun fun story is you know here I'm this person who, who is a computer scientist, and um, we were working with the U.S. government on a, on a very serious matter, and we were supposed to have a meeting in, in the Treasury building, and if any of you folks have been to D.C. or seen the pictures of the Treasury building, it's right next to the White House, and it's this beautiful, they are all, these are incredible buildings, it's a beautiful building with you know, columns and these four, these four porticos, angled porticos on, on the top of the building. And so uh, one of the, the people that, our consultants that we were going in with said, you know, now prepare yourself. Uh, this meeting is in the attic. And I thought, oh, the attic of <laughs> treasury? <laughs> and so it turns out the meeting was in the attic. It was in one of those windowless porticos and it truly did. There was no brooms or dustbins there, but it, it was painted gray, had sloping ceilings, and it did look like an attic. And so it really kind of brought brought home, you know, in, in a very serious matter, um, you know, these you know, buildings are just buildings and people are just people and we all work together to try to move the world forward. So every time I walk by that building now in, in DC, you know, I just, just puts a smile on my face. Um, so having said all that, why don't we uh, give some time for questions or, or comments? I'm happy to take anything that, that you would like. Yeah, so um, if you have any questions, please put them in the Q&A and we'll just wait a second and then we'll get them to Ms. Armstrong. And if you don't, I can go on forever. <laughs> <laughs> I, can, I can talk forever, which is amazing for somebody who, who a number of years ago would rather put hot needles in her eyes than give a public talk. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we do have one question. Um, what advice do you have for high school students considering this career or field? Um, my, my advice is... Uh, build the background. Um, there's, you know, there's a lot of people, you know, I was going to be a veterinarian and then, you know, I was a computer scientist and I had no idea I'd end up in, you know, government affairs or opening an India office. So um, my point is build a background. Don't worry about whether you are going to be a, a programmer the rest of your life or you're going to be, you know, doing mechanical engineering the rest of your life is build that background because whether you want to go into you know, policy, or you want to go into business, or you want to go into marketing, building that background just opens doors for you. Um, where, uh, and, and when I say build the background, build that technical background. And so I, I assume, you know, many of you, or all of you, or most of you are, are you know, involved in, in um, FIRST Robotics. So I, I think that's a, uh, an excellent first step. But uh, I can't under, undersell the power of actually having that technical or scientific background because it then it branches off from there. Thank you. Yeah, I think that's very important. Um, 
we have a couple connected questions. So someone asks, what is it like to be senior vice president and what's the favorite, your favorite thing about your job? Senior vice president, yes. Um, it means when you need a meeting moved, you can usually get the meeting moved. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, being a senior vice president, so I, I probably haven't actually touched code for probably 10 years, although occasionally I go back. I, I, as part of our STEM programs, I uh, went back and learned um, to program in, in C to program my little Arduino board. And I was so thrilled when that little LED light <laughs> lit up. Um, so, you know, as you move up in leadership, what you realize uh, is that uh, even though you miss some of the hands-on engineering, what you, what you gain is with your background, you gain leverage. You know, you, you can help people leverage your work. For example, you know, in, into the software, there's tens of millions of lines of code that go into a, a cell phone. And, uh, you know, so no one person, no matter how brilliant they are, can can actually uh, create that. Um, and and so being able to moving up in leadership gives you the opportunity um, to help other to help yourself and to help other people leverage their work to be something sort of greater than the, the, the sum is greater than the, than the parts. And that, that's actually one of my favorite pieces of the leadership aspect, besides being able to move meetings, um, of being an SVP. Right now, the my um, my favorite part of my my job is pretty much what it's what it tends to have been all the time. It's it's the collaboration. I work with. I don't like to work alone, <laughs> um, and I think that's a fallacy that some people think about. You know, engineers sitting in dark labs. I've spent my time in dark labs, but it's usually with a bunch of other people. Um, and uh, you know, so I, I love that collaboration because there's just such such power to you know working with a group, and especially working with a group that you get along with, whether it's in engineering or whether it's in in government affairs. And some of these problems, whether they're engineering problems or they're policy problems, they're really hard. They're really complex and they're really hard. And and yet you know, like failure is not really an option. And so to be working with a set of, uh, 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 a set of colleagues that you, you trust and laugh and laugh about some of the incredibly stressful times, um, it, there's no feeling like that. That's my favorite part of the job is collaboration. Yeah, thank you. Um, here's another question. What advice do you have for young women moving forward with STEM careers, especially in light of the male dominance of these careers? You're living it. You people are doing it. Um, it, it is. It's a, it's a male-dominated field, and especially when I was working so much in, in Asia. All the people, people treated me uh, very, very nicely, very, you know, very collaboratively. Engineering is the big, the big uh, equalizer, I always say because those schedules are so critical that nobody cares what gender you are, what color your hair is, what color your skin is, you gotta get the product out. And so the advice I would, would give again is build the background, but I think there is no better time than now to be a, a young woman looking at some sort of a STEM related field because there's so many programs out there. There's FIRST, there's, you know, there's webinars. And as you can see from you know, the other speakers on this, this um, on on this call, we all want to help. You know, maybe we can't help every individual, but there is this whole, and it's not just senior women. It's it's men. As you know, our CEO is very involved in in STEM outreach programs. So take advantage of them. You know, look for your first programs. Look for any other programs. Look for the webinars. Reach out to a local engineering company because. Everybody wants to help address this problem, and it's it's sort of yours for the taking. And don't be int intimidated by you know the male dominated. They're just people. Men are just people, right? <laughs> we all, we love them as well. And so don't be intimidated by that. You have you have a tremendous amount. Women and and every person has a tremendous amount to offer. 
And actually research shows that diverse teams, and this is what companies are so interested in, diverse teams um, end up performing um, uh, better than non-diverse teams. And there's, there's good hard research to, to support that. So take advantage of these, the opportunities right now and, and the, dis, the cognizance of these, these uh, issues. Yeah, thank you for um, that advice. That's a great answer. Um, one more question. What does the average day on your job look like and what is your work atmosphere and environment like? Okay, so a couple of years ago in engineering, I, you know, when we were all in person, um, we participate in a lot of job shadow programs and, and my job shadow, who is a high, a high school student from San Diego, her conclusion was that I went to meetings and ate. <laughs> so I try not to eat so much. Um, so a typical day for, for me right now is, uh, is you know, people, people laugh about meetings and sort of pan uh, going to meetings, but meetings are a critical part of collaboration, whether you're um, you know, pre-COVID and hopefully post-COVID, you know, whether you're going in, in person, that, you know, going to a meeting isn't just sitting in a boring meeting. Some of them are boring. Um, it, it's, you know, it's a, it's a collaboration. So a typical day is I probably have three or four meetings on any one of, um, I deal with a lot of topics, but at any one time, probably two very major topics. Um, and these are, even in policy work, they're sort of long-term um, topics. Sometimes they reach crisis proportions. Um, so typical day is you go to a couple of meetings and you, you work with your, your colleagues, you figure out what the next steps um, are in, in those. You, I, right now, I am writing a lot. Um, so, and for me, and I think for most people to write, and to, fo to focus and to write something intelligent, you need like a block, I need a block of two hours to really, you know, write something that is hard, hard to write. So I'll have, you know, a break of a couple hours where I write something that will go into a, uh, you know, a, a, a talk or a piece of, a piece of policy um, uh, or, or briefing for, you know, for a, a government audience. Um, so that that's sort of a, a, a typical day. And, and we're, you know, the meetings are even more important now in, in this COVID time. We're all working from home, except for some of the engineers that are critical to have on-site, you know, lab equipment. And so um, we actually look forward to meetings even more than we, we used to. Yeah, thank you. Um, and thank you for all of the questions that were put into the Q&A. Um, is there anything else you would like to say, Ms. Armstrong? Nope, just again, that it's an honor and I hope, I hope to see you all in the workforce before I'm, before I'm too old to see you. <laughs> then thank you again for joining us this morning. We're so happy we got to hear from you. Um, then we'll go on to our second or um, First, we have a little um, announcement about the National Advocacy Conference. Um, yeah. Megan would just like to say a few things on that. Yeah, so I, Ms. Arnshaw mentioned how she was involved in both the engineering and public policy aspects um, in her work. And our team is actually on the first National Advocacy Conference Coordinating Committee. So our team works to plan a advocacy conference every year in Washington, D.C. And this year the conference is being held in June um, 2021. And so if any of your teams are interested in possibly attending, you get to work to talk with your uh, representatives and advocate for funding for FIRST and STEM policy. So if anyone is interested in that, you can just email our team and we'd be happy to talk to you about that. Thank you. 
Um, so now we'll welcome Ms. May on. She is a computer scientist at NIST. Her research focus includes evaluation of face recognition and tattoo recognition technologies. May was awarded the Department of Commerce Gold Medal Award in 2020 and was a recipient of the 2020 Women in Biometrics Award, a globally recognized award honoring innovative women in the biometrics field. We're so happy to have you this morning. Um, go ahead and share your screen. Hi, good morning, everyone. Um, can you hear me okay? Uh, yes. First, I want to thank the girls of the um, Greentail FTC robotics team for having me here today. Also, uh, thank you, Susie, and the rest of the presenters for presenting today. Um, very fascinating information you just shared, Susie. Let me try and share my screen here. Can you see my screen? Yes. All right. Um, so good morning again, everyone. My name is May Ahn. I'm a computer scientist from the National Institute of Standards and Technology, also known as NIST. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about my research today um, and also uh, sort of an unexpected path into and through my STEM career. First, just a little bit about myself. I was born in Hong Kong and my family immigrated to the United States when I was just a baby. So um, since then, I grew up and currently live in Montgomery County, Maryland. I did both my undergrad and graduate degrees in the state of Maryland. And I've been working at NIST since uh, 2011, which only seems like yesterday. Um, I have two daughters, uh, ages eight and 11, which are great ages at the moment. And um, some of my hobbies include running, hiking, painting, eating. Um, my, me and my husband, we, we do a lot of the local races here for fun. First, a little bit about where I work. Um, again, I work at NIST uh, and we are a physical sciences laboratory, which is a non-regulatory arm of the United States Department of Commerce. So our mission is to promote innovation and industrial competitiveness. And we primarily work on standards and measurement. Um, some of uh, our activities are organized into laboratory programs. And the group that I work in is a part of the information technology laboratory. And one sort of interesting fact about NIST is that we actually have a nuclear reactor on site that's used to provide a steady supply of neutrons used to explore the structure and dynamics of uh, novel materials. So here's a demographic breakdown of the people who work here at NIST. Um, NIST is extremely supportive of diversity and there are a number of ongoing diversity initiatives to try and bring in people of different backgrounds. And I know that the lab that I work in is always trying to recruit for qualified minorities and more importantly, female engineers and scientists to try and balance out this sort of gender disparity that we see in our employee statistics. They say the average college student switches majors about two to three times before graduating. Um, and when I was in college, I switched majors twice before graduating with the degree in computer engineering. Um, my senior year of high school, I applied to the University of Maryland as an accounting major, which was a part of their business school. And um, to be honest, I had never thought about majoring in engineering because at the time, a, a degree in STEM sort of seemed unattainable to me. Um, and at the time, there weren't that many initiatives to try and promote females to go into STEM programs. So um, the summer before my freshman year of college, I took a summer job at the Sports Authority, which is a which was a uh, sporting goods retail store that has since gone out of business. Um, so one day during lunch break, I was talking to one of my coworkers who told me that they were a sophomore at Maryland um, and they were majoring in electrical engineering. Um, and when I told him I was going to Maryland in the fall as well, he tried to convince me that they needed more girls in the engineering classes because his engineering classes always felt sort of bare. So um, we, we got talking and I told him that I didn't think I could do engineering um, and it just sounded so hard. And his response to me was, oh, it's not that hard. Um, it's not as hard as everyone perceives engineering to be. Plus, if you take a couple of classes and it's not your thing, you could go back to accounting. So I, I've never been much of a risk taker at all, but something about what he said to me uh, convinced me enough to go to the admissions office um, and switch my major to electrical engineering. So with about two weeks to spare before my, uh, my freshman year, I was now an electrical engineering major. 
And one of my first in engineering classes was a C, program, C programming class for um, double E majors. And what my coworker said was pretty accurate. There were only a handful of girls in my classes. Um, coincidentally, it was also that first C programming class that made me fall in love with programming. And later on uh, was the driving force for me to switch over as a computer engineering major. Um, my journey to NIST was not a very, very straight one. Um, my first job out of college, uh, I took a job with the Lockheed Martin Corporation and I was hired into their engineering leadership, de leadership development program. Um, and that program allowed me to take various rotations across the company. And some of the positions were technical positions and some of them were not. Um, I was at Lockheed for about seven years when I had to make what seemed like uh, one of the hardest decisions of my life, which was to leave my first job. And this decision came about shortly after we had our first daughter. I was working in a classified environment, um, no windows, no cell phone access, which was okay for a while, but um, ever since our first child was born, I needed to be accessible. So I'd start looking for a job. Um, coincidentally, Booz Allen Hamilton, a big consulting firm, was looking for a scientist uh, to support a contract that they had through the FBI at NIST. Um, and NIST was just a 15 minute drive from my house, so it sounded great. Um, and, uh, <laughs> I was there for about uh, six months working in their biometrics group when I was contacted uh, by my Booz Allen manager saying that the contract with the FBI was unexpectedly canceled. So, um, yep, life is never just a single road. Uh, and I had heard a lot of stories about the volatility of the consulting business, but it's something else when you experience it firsthand. So in addition to accessibility, right? Um, job security was another item that I added high on the list um, for my next job search. So I wanted to continue working in biometrics um, and I decided to take a position at the MITRE Corporation in their biometrics group, which was where I started doing research on tattoo recognition. Um, there was a sponsor uh, who wanted to develop a standard tattoo data set that can be used to test tattoo recognition algorithms. Um, and we also had to come up with the baseline algorithm to validate whether this data set was actually useful. It was all very fascinating and interesting work, right? Um, but uh, yet another path or, or road opened up shortly after I started working at MITRE. Uh, my former boss from NIST, uh, who found me at MITRE, worked out an agreement with uh, my management to bring me back to NIST as a part-time guest researcher uh, to, to continue doing the biometrics work that I was doing. And then shortly after that, I was hired on as a full-time scientist at NIST. Um, so as I mentioned, I work in the biometrics group and my primary focus as of late has been research and evaluation of automated face recognition algorithms. Um, NIST has been doing work in this area for well over two decades now. Um, and our flagship benchmark is what we call the face recognition vendor test, FRVT. And what FRVT is, it's an ongoing test where developers can send their algorithms to NIST at any time. And we test them on any number of sequestered data sets, data sets that presumably have never been seen by the developers before. And then we publish numbers, we publish reports, which can include anything um, such as accuracy, speed, resource consumption, and just any number of analysis points that we feel would be useful to uh, both end users and the developers. So uh, we don't develop face recognition algorithms, we test them, uh, sort of like the consumer reports. And generally we don't do policy, we don't do regulation, we, we publish the numbers and let the readers use the information however it applies to their operations. Our tests are free and open worldwide and we have a large percentage of the commercial market who have participated in our tests. Um, and we currently have over 100 organization, 180 organizations participating in our tests worldwide. Um, and that number grows sort of on a, on a weekly basis. Um, and since 2017, we've tested and reported on over 800 face recognition algorithms. Uh, I'm going to go over uh, some of the use cases that we look at very quickly. In face recognition, um, the core algorithmic operation is what we call one-to-one -one comparison are two images of the same person or not. Um, and one-to-one -one face recognition systems that are widely deployed today include e-gates, um, if you've ever used one at an airport to authenticate uh, people against their passport, and also um, cell phones, right, where you use your face to unlock the phone. So um, 
in testing how all these algorithms work, we measure a bunch of things. How often the algorithms uh, can incorrectly reject two images of the same people as being different. Um, likewise, we measure how often images of different people are mistakenly matched as being the same person. Um, and then algorithm performance across various types of imagery and uh, resource related information. So another common use case of face recognition is what we call a one-to-many search against a database of people. Um, and th in this case, we have a database of enrolled people and we search an image against the database and we wanna know, is this person in the database or not? And what gets returned is a candidate list of people that match the search image above some threshold. Um, and then we measure things. We measure how often the algorithms miss retrieving a person that's in a database, how often algorithms return a match when the person actually isn't in the database, um, whether the database size matters on performance um, and various resource statistics related to that. All right, um, this is the only graph in my presentation today, I promise. Um, what we're plotting here is face recognition error rates over time, starting from 2017. Um, and what we've seen is significant reductions in face recognition error rates over just these past few years. Um, and these rapid performance improvements we've seen um, is in large part due to a recent revolution of machine learning methodologies and the application of what we call deep convolutional neural networks to face recognition implementations. Um, so these results um, are showing that in 2017, error rates in the best cases were just below 3%. And over the years, error rates have dropped significantly. Um, and while it looks like the values are approaching zero, they're not really zero. Um, and this has to do with, you know, recognition failures in babies and twins, which remains an open research problem. But um, the leading face recognition algorithms can be quite accurate on well-controlled full frontal images. Another recent study that we've published results on is how well face recognition works when a subject's face is covered by a face mask. Um, and this was obviously motivated by the COVID-19 pandemic where people are walking around in public places in masks now. And there's a need to be able to use face recognition while wearing a mask. For example, from trying to unlock our cell phones while we're out grocery shopping wearing a mask to being able to use e-gates at airports without needing to remove our masks for safety reasons. Um, so as Face recognition has seen notable technology improvements in recent years. Simultaneously though, image manipulation technologies and ways to exploit the vulnerabilities of um, face recognition have also advanced. And it's been getting the attention of both end users and policymakers. So um, the, uh, this topic is about face morphing, which is one of the image manipulation techniques that has surfaced um, and is a vulnerability to current face recognition technology. So uh, what is face morphing? It's essentially the blending or merging of two faces of different people. Um, and the problem here is when you generate a morph photo of essentially two different identities, um, if, you, if that image gets onto say a passport photo, face recognition algorithms will actually match both people to that morphed image. Um, and the consequences of that is if a morph photo gets onto a passport, now two different people can use that same passport to cross an e-gate, for example, which is powered by an automated face recognition system underneath the hood. Let me just highlight some of the internship opportunities that are available to NIST. Uh, at NIST, we have a summer high school intern program for high school juniors and seniors. And it's an eight week unpaid volunteer program where students uh, will work with an scientist on a STEM related project. Um, and this is a great opportunity for um, high school students to get some um, uh, experience, but also uh, get a taste of what it would be like um, to do uh, potentially a career in STEM. So this year's summer internship program is, uh, I think, going to be a virtual program. Um, and for anyone who's interested, there's a, a link at the bottom of the slide for more information. We also have a summer undergraduate research fellowship. And this program is targeted for undergraduate college students. It's an 11 week program over the summer and it's very structured. They do a very good job immersing the interns uh, into the NIST environment. And SURF students do get a stipend for their appointment. And um, there's a big event at the end of the 11 weeks where 
all of the SURF students have the opportunity to present on their research. Um, and it, it really is a, a great program. Um, so uh, for those who might be interested, uh, you can find more information at the SURF website. Um, and with that, I think I'm running out of time, but um, I'll end with a few closing thoughts here. If someone were to ask me what, what were the key things that made a difference um, in my path into and through a career in STEM thus far, um, it would be these two things. It would be mentoring and public speaking. Um, first, finding a mentor and having at least one mentor at any given time in your career is so important because your mentor will be your biggest assets when it comes to getting impartial feedback and advice, both in your career and in your life. Um, and they also help you set expectations and they're really your biggest advocate. Um, public speaking is a bit of a stressful topic for me because I've always hated public speaking. I'm, I'm an introvert um, and I prefer to listen to others than to speak in front of a big crowd. Uh, coming to NIST though has really stretched my public speaking muscles because in order to communicate my research, I have to talk to people um, and, and, and in a coherent way. Um, and this is near and dear to my heart. I, the only thing I can say is pra practice makes perfect. Um, and believe it or not, the more you do it, the easier it gets. I've spoken to myself in front of a mirror many, many times, um, worrying about that I might trip over my words or nobody cares what I'm presenting and talking about. And at the beginning, um, the Toastmasters program at NIST really, really, really helped me. And it's targeted um, to help people improve their uh, public speaking and communication skills. Um, and with that, I'd be happy to um, take any questions or comments. All right, thank you so much for your presentation. We'll wait a minute or two to see if there are any questions. Remember, put it in the Q&A. All right, we got a question. Okay. Is your job hard? <laughs> um, I really enjoy the work that I do. Uh, when I first started in biometrics, um, there was a, definitely a learning curve when it comes to you know the terminology and what biometrics really is and how it, it's being measured and how it's being used. Um, and I'm always learning every, every single day. And from technical things such as um, doing programming, uh, using statistical packages such as R, writing reports such as LaTeX, and also having to publicly communicate my research. But I think um, the environment that I'm in uh, allows me to sort of thrive because there's a lot of resources at NIST, such as say the Toastmasters program. And there's also a lot of you know uh, brown bags and technical classes that, that you can take to try and augment what you're trying to do. All right. Do you have any advice for advancing your career while also raising a healthy family? That's a very good question. Um, to be very honest, um, I never imagined that I would be at NIST doing what I'm doing here today. It, that's just sort of the, the way things fell out. But one thing I did realize and I've learned, especially during this pandemic, uh, family is very important to me. And um, it's really hard to juggle both of them at the same time. But uh, the key is to be present, meaning that you know when, when I'm with my family, I'm there, I'm not doing anything else. I'm listening, I'm there, I'm focused. And likewise with my career, um, if I'm focused on doing something or I'm a me in a meeting, right? I'm, I'm focused and I'm present, not doing anything else. All right. Did you have any experience or interest in programming before college? So back in those days, um, I went to a high school that uh, the closest thing to programming was typing class. And I did not have any prior pro uh, programming experience whatsoever before going into that electrical engineering um, major. But um, with that said, we go to college, we go to school to learn. And the, the degree that I got from Maryland really, really prepped me for the real world. All right. When you switch your major to engineering, how much prior experience did you have? Uh, close to none. Um, I was always pretty good at math, which is one of the reasons why I chose accounting. Um, I figured, you know, numbers is my thing, so it, it should be okay. But um, in terms of, you know, any sort of programming, 
um, or engineering class, I, I didn't have any experience in high school before going into college. What is the most exciting issue you've seen been solved in regards to facial recognition in your job? Hmm, that's a very good question. So what I, what I would say is I started doing this work maybe about a decade ago. And back then, um, the accuracy rates were not that high. So um, the, the application and the use of face recognition algorithms was actually not as ubiquitous as it is today. But watching the technology just progress just so rapidly over these past few years, and the technology has gotten to a point where it can do a pretty good job uh, matching people even when uh, most of your face is covered from the eyes down. It's just been remarkable. And we're gonna, I think we're going to continue to see improvements uh, moving forward. But it's exciting times right now. Our final question is, when did you know you wanted to become a computer scientist? Yeah, so uh, I may have mentioned this earlier. Um, I took my first C programming class um, as a part of my um, undergraduate program, the double E program. And it was probably my second semester when I started taking that class. And after that class, I realized I, I really do love software programming. And that was when I decided I was going to switch over to computer engineering and pursue um, a career doing some sort of software development. All right. Thank you so much for your presentation. It was very great. Thanks for having me. Looking forward to the remaining uh, presentations. All right. Reminder to stay until the end, we will play Kahoot on Women in STEM and the top three will receive prizes. And our next speaker is Ms. Ashley Flegel. She is a projects manager at the Aeronautics Mission Office at NASA. Ms. Flegel received her Bachelor of Science in Mechanical Engineering from the University of Toledo in 2007 and Master of Science in Mechanical Engineering from Cleveland State University in 2013. Ashley has 14 years of experience in the turbo machinery field at NASA Glenn Research Center. Her broad experience led her to be the technical lead and conduct experiments concerning engine ice crystal icing. Ms. Flagel, if you would like to share your screen and begin your presentation. Sure. Okay, and can you hear me okay? Thank you. So thank you so much for having me talk today. And I love hearing the other, other panelists and, and seeing their stories. Uh, my name is Ashley Flagel, And as mentioned, uh, I work at NASA Glenn Research Center in Cleveland, Ohio. And we'll see if we can get my cursor to work uh, in Cleveland, Ohio. And as you can see, there's a lot of NASA centers across the, the country, and we all have different aspects of what we bring to the table in terms of uh, meeting the NASA missions. And as you heard, uh, maybe this week we landed on Mars, uh, the rover Perseverance. And so when you think of NASA, you think of the rovers, you think of the rockets and the astronauts. Um, but one thing that you don't always think of with NASA is that first A in NASA, aeronautics. And that is where I've spent my entire career working in. Uh, on my charts, you're gonna see a picture of a jet engine. And I have explored many different areas of a jet engine in the last 14 years. Each box represents uh, a different job that I've had at NASA at one time or another. And, uh, you know, the goals that I have had in my various jobs is having, um, trying to make these engines, how do we make them more efficient, burn less fuel, and um, with that, there's other technologies of, instead of using these, what you're seeing a picture of is a turbofan jet engine, can we introduce electrical engines into the mix too for low fuel burn, and then also safety uh, as well. So I actually started off at NASA um, as a mechanical test engineer. And so I was working, I had a facility working with the researchers trying to build up uh, these compressor rigs, as you can see in the center, compressor rigs. 
and run these tests. So it was a very hands-on job. Uh, it was a lot of fun to do. And then I wanted to see more of, um, you know, from beginning to end of a research project. How do we figure out what we need to test? And then how do we, you know, build up that hypothesis, go build up the test, run the analysis, publish results. So I took a job as an aerospace research engineer. And uh, what you'll learn later is I have a background in mechanical engineering, and it was very broad where I could go into this aeronautics field. So I spent five years working on turbine research. And what's interesting about this part of the engine, which is further back, is that these turbine blades can see about 3,000 degrees Fahrenheit. And it's really the workhorse of the engine where we're trying to extract power to make this engine powerful moving forward. Um, and so there's kind of two aspects to this research. Well, how do we make sure we can protect those blades from that, that high temperature? And also in order to make those engines more efficient, we want to raise that temperature up. So how do we make sure we maintain durability, safety of those turbine blades, but then also make them efficient so they can pull more power out of the engine, out of the air. So I did that for about five years, and then I had the opportunity to lead NASA's engine icing research, and so that took me back to the front of the engine. And this was a really unique experience where I was testing now full-scale engines. We have a test cell at NASA Glenn where we can stick an engine into a ground test facility and we can actually simulate atmosphere so the plane thinks it's flying and then we're able to throw uh, generate ice clouds, um, anywhere from a liquid cloud, which is what you typically see uh, in the sky and also uh, high altitude uh, ice crystal icing is what I was really um, exploring. And so we would throw these ice clouds at the engine and try and understand why we have ice uh, building up inside of an engine. We're the only facility in the world that has this capability. So it has been really exciting to do this type of research. Now I'm about uh, a year and a half into it. I am an uh, aeronautics uh, project manager. So uh, I help advocate for research. I help work with the researchers um, trying to push forward our aeronautics missions, which I'll talk a little bit later. Um, Ms. Flegel, sorry to interrupt, yeah. but um, your slides aren't advancing at all. Oh, they're um, not? Okay. Would you like us to share them for you? Or? Sure. Okay. Sure, if you'd like to do that. Okay, thank you. Yep. Awesome. Okay, uh, so I don't know if anybody got to see this chart, but this is, you know, up in the upper right hand corner, you can see the jet engine and uh, some photos of different research areas that I've worked in. And if you wanna go to the next slide, please. So the one thing about NASA Aeronautics uh, is our tagline is we're with you when you fly. And you might not be able to read all the words uh, on this chart, but the main takeaway here is that NASA technology is heavily embedded into, for example, this commercial aircraft, but we also work on rotorcraft, military planes, uh, regional jets as well. Uh, NASA's built up technology all the way from uh, our air traffic management to the GPS communication systems, and then just various aspects uh, of the aircraft itself. Next chart, please. So I knew at a very young age that I wanted to have a 
career at NASA. And actually, along with NASA, I also had other careers, a, a long job list of things that I was interested in. But through the test of time, NASA kind of always stood out. And so what you see is a picture of me and my brothers on uh, during spring break, the family, uh, we took a trip to Kennedy Space Center and I was uh, in eighth grade in this picture. So how did I go from this eighth grader that dreamed of one day working at NASA to actually achieving that? Next chart. And that was through exploration. And that's something you all are doing right now with uh, listening to us on this panel. Uh, you know, I try to explore what are my interests? What do I like, dislike? And so what did my exploration look like? Next chart, please. So for me uh, in middle school, I try to gear activities uh, towards um, STEM areas. And STEM wasn't really a big word back then and really wasn't pushed. But I knew if you looked at my list of different careers, it, they were all kind of STEM, science, engineering related. And uh, so I looked at gearing activities such as 4-H projects. 4-H is a youth development program. And uh, like Susie, I had an interest, uh, a veterinarian was on my list as well. And so this is a picture of me. I did a couple years of a veterinary science project and learned, eh, you know, it was interesting, but it just wasn't for me. I couldn't see going to school for that. Another way of gearing activities was school reports. When you're given a reading assignment or a report assignment, I try to spin it in a way to, you know, look at things I was interested in. Uh, this is an example of a report before computers. Um, this is a handwritten report on uh, American Hero, and I chose Neil Armstrong, and I learned about his journey to be an astronaut. Next chart. Then in high school, that's when I really started to buckle down and I knew that if I wanted to work at NASA, well, what kind of education would I need? What kind of career do you have to be at NASA? And so that was, you know, getting on the internet, looking at astronauts biographies or anybody else's biographies where it lists where they went to school, what did they go to school for? I also started doing science fairs. And then uh, there was also, and NASA still offers this, uh, shadowing and uh, high school internships. I actually did three internships at NASA, one in high school and two in college. And that really uh, opened the door for me to really understand what kind of career you could have at NASA. I had the opportunity to talk with engineers and mechanics and technicians and all sorts of different engineers, electrical, mechanical, aerospace, uh, biomedical. So it was a great opportunity to really explore the different fields I might be interested in that could still lead me to NASA. Uh, mentoring and networking was huge for me uh, with these opportunities as well. So next chart, please. So I actually went to the University of Toledo, uh, majored in mechanical engineering. I chose mechanical because I liked how broad it was. I could take that degree and go to NASA, or if NASA didn't work out, you know, I had an interest in automotive field or the agricultural field. Uh, those were kind of my backup plans, and I could take that degree and go into those directions. I also was involved with student organizations such as uh, Society Automotive Engineers, and I was able to spend four years building a uh, building race cars, which is really cool. And actually, I'm so grateful that I took that opportunity and went for it because, um, you know, I thought that I would just go to school, buckle down on education and not be involved in anything. But through mentoring, I was told, you know, you need to be able to get some uh, experience and teamwork, build those soft skills that you're not going to get in the classroom. And so that helped prompt me to join this team. And everything that I had learned on this team, we had one year in a very limited budget to design and build an open wheel Formula One style race car. And then you compete against uh, universities all over the world. 
And that in itself, we had a small team, you're working different aspects and trying to come together and build a car. That's what it takes to have a successful mission at NASA or a successful engineering project. And so my time being on the team I was able to translate to a job at NASA. And so when I went to interview and I brought all the, this experience forward, that really helped push me above and beyond um, my peers that were also interviewing and being able to get a job at NASA. Next chart, please. So as I mentioned, now I'm in uh, the project management and uh, things that we're looking at is building these projects to try to tackle uh, the next you know, generation challenges and build the next generation future aircraft. You know, aviation is gonna look a lot different. Uh, one of the things we're looking at is how to enable supersonic travel over land. Uh, and that's the, the photo that you see in the upper left. Uh, we're trying to develop planes uh, running on electric propulsion or utilizing um, smaller planes like in the lower left, 100 passenger aircraft that can utilize smaller airports so we can eliminate all this airport congestion. And uh, Another area is utilizing kind of flying taxis, bringing Jetsons <laughs> to real life uh, through uh, advanced air mobility type of programs. However, there's a lot of technical challenges associated with that. And so we're building up programs, having teams of researchers look at them so we can push these concepts forward and make them a reality. Next chart. So NASA always has a lot of space missions that you hear about, but aeronautics we do as well. We actually have X-Planes, it's called uh, X-Planes, stands for experimental aircraft. And we have two that you can learn about uh, through various social media or just Googling. Uh, we have the X-57 Maxwell, which is NASA's uh, first all electric plane. We're building it in different stages. So you can go online and kind of learn about the different flight tests that are taking place. We also have the X-59, which is our quiet supersonic uh, technology aircraft. And it's currently being built up right now. A lot of news surrounding that. And it's uh, targeting a first flight in the summer of 2022. And that's all I have right now. So I'd like to open it up to any questions you have. Yeah, thank you so much. So please yeah. put any questions you have for Mrs. Fuggle in the Q&A. Okay. So our first question is um, relating to colleges. So um, would you say that a student um, should be worried that they need to go to a more expensive private or polytech institute instead of their like state school. Yeah, so I will give you a story when I was looking at colleges um, and I went to a college fair and there is actually a NASA booth there and I, I beelined straight for it and asked them, you know, well, what kind of school should I look at? And you know, I was given a really interesting answer that still sticks with me today. And uh, I did end up going to a small, it was a smaller state school. And I was looking at these bigger schools, um, more expensive schools. I'll tell you that my, my family and myself, we weren't going to be able to uh, afford those. So that was kind of out of the question. But I was still looking at these bigger schools. And I was told, you know, think about really look into the program, see if it's a good fit for you. They didn't really like the big schools because sometimes you're treated as just a number. Um, but I take that looking at some of the schools today, really look at what the programs have to offer and does it align with your interest. Um, I went to um, a smaller school and I thought that maybe that could hurt my chances getting into NASA. However, having internship ex um, opportunities to take those internship experiences, um, you know, getting a good background in engineering, you know, trying to figure out what, how I can build up my experience to kind of put me, you know, maybe a step above somebody else that might be at, you know, a, a bigger name school. Those are all things that help, um, you know, get me 
in Denasa, and I really liked the smaller school experience. Um, I felt like I had more one-on-one -on -one, uh, attention. So, you know, choose what you feel most comfortable with. And then like Susie mentioned before, I really like that build up your experience, you know, try to figure out how you can make yourself stand up, a, a stand out ahead of everyone based on your experience. You know, don't worry necessarily about what school, you know, the name school that you're, you're going to. Awesome. That's a great answer. We have another question about um, when you were building the cars in college. Um, yeah. Someone wanted to know how many other women invo were involved and what that experience was like. <laughs> Yeah, so my entire four years, uh, I was the only female on the team. And I will let you know that by uh, year three, I was leading the team. Uh, and then the last year, I was the, the main um, project, you know, formal project manager, team lead, president of SAE, and all of that. Um, and you know what? It was it was one of those you kind of wish that you had other females on the team, but I also looked at it. I was doing what I wanted to do and what I loved, and I kind of was just able, you know. I, I again, I love Susie's answer. We're all humans. We're all people, and so you know, so I'm the only female on the team. Okay, you know, I'm not gonna let that hold me back, and I'm gonna do the best job I can, and then you know, as I mentioned, look where it took me by the end of four years, I was running the team. Um, so it was a great experience. Uh, you know, I look at it more as um, the the t the engineering and leadership experience I took from, from building, um, working on the team. And yeah, I was the only female, but I will let you know there had been, uh, I keep tabs on the team uh, throughout the years, and there's um, finally starting to be more uh, females on the Formula Car teams. Yeah, that's uh, that's very inspiring. I know a lot of people probably face situations where they're one of the only girls interested in something <laughs> in STEM, but I think you should go for it as well. Um, oh, yeah. We have an interesting question. Um, how do you do you see environmental efforts being incorporated into future aircraft vessels? Yes, so uh, I'm actually working, I'm on a team, we're building up a brand new uh, program. Uh, it's called Hybrid Thermally Efficient um, Engine. And one of the aspects to it is we're really looking at the environmental uh, impacts to these jet engines. So that's been at the forefront between that project. We have other projects um, with electrified aircraft propulsion that is really looking at at that environmental side. Uh, so it's starting to take even more of a forefront uh, now as we move forward with these new aircraft design. Awesome, then our final question is, what do you like most about your job? So the thing I love most about my job is the collaboration side. Uh, I love, you know, um, being able to work with not just the, the NASA folks, but I'm also working with uh, various industry, um, international and domestic. I'm working with regulators. So we, you know, it's a community coming together to try to push research forward, you know, make uh, aviation, you know, better than we're, when we left it. And so I love that aspect of, you know, it takes kind of a village, it takes a team, and it's more than just NASA. Um, so I like building those relationships and I, I love advocating for research. So I'm, I'm loving the new job uh, that I'm in because I can take more of a, a front seat into advocating for work that we do. Uh, so um, just making an impact and knowing that um, there's certain aspects of when I see a plane fly overhead, I can say like, hey, I helped you know, enable um, certain aspects of that, that engine or that aircraft. Thank you so much for speaking today. It was very inspiring to hear from you. And yeah, we're going to move on to our next speaker. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Our next speaker, Megan said, if you could go to Kahoot.it and enter the code 6636526. We'll just wait a few seconds. And remember, if you do participate in the Kahoot, the top three winners will receive $10 Visa gift card.
Okay, then we'll just go ahead and start. Okay. So it's a uh, women in STEM cahoot. Susan Kerr is an icon iconographer, which means she does what? Good job, the nine people who got it right. Um, who found a moth messing with the Harvard Mark computer, removed it, and coined the term debugging? Ooh, good job, guys. Which of our speakers worked in the cellular industry, resulting in the first web surfing on a cellular phone? Good job. Yeah, Miss Armstrong. Which woman is known as a pioneer of public health and founder of modern nursing? who is Canada's first female astronaut and received over 20 honorary degrees for her work. Yeah, Roberta Bondar. Here are top five so far. Which of our speakers was born in New Zealand? Mm -hmm. Yeah, Miss Ender. Katherine Johnson, a NASA space scientist, did the calculations for that guided what mission? Oh. Who knew that she wanted to be a scientist at age 15, even when colleges did not have science classes for women? Rosalind Franklin. Nice. Oh, there goes Siri. 
who is the only woman who has won two Nobel Prizes, one in 1903 and then again in 1911. Yeah, Marie Curie. Looks like most of you got that one. Who made significant contributions to nuclear physics, a separation of uranium on the Manhattan Project? Mm -hmm. Who used her book, Under the Sea Wind, to raise awareness on the impact humans have on the natural environment? Ooh. Okay, last question. We'll see who comes out on top. Who was the first African-American woman to receive a PhD in engineering at NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center? Nice. Okay. Nice. Team 1023. Aubrey. And Ashley. Good job, you guys. Congratulations to the three winners. Please stay on the Zoom for a couple more minutes after the webinar is done. And if you would private message the host with the email address in the Q&A, we can send you your prize. Thank you everyone so much for attending this webinar. We hope you guys all learned so much from our four amazing speakers about their jobs, their past to where they are and their experience as a woman in STEM. Um, as always, you are welcome to connect with us on social media. We'd love to hear from you guys at Greendale FPC on Instagram, Twitter, or Facebook. And with that, we hope you guys have a great rest of your day.